I want to follow up on what you said on, inten on unintended consequences. Uh, and certainly I would agree that uh, one has to do due diligence on any decision in international affairs. But uh, due diligence doesn't always give a clear answer. And there's in recent years, there have been Iraq, there have been uh, Libya, there have been Syria, a case of massive intervention, a case of light intervention, a case of no intervention or marginal intervention, and all three with uh, uh, bad, uh, bad results. Uh, and so, as you make the decision, you can never tell really what the, I mean, in some cases you can, but in many situations you cannot. And for the United States, for a global power, this raises specific issues because the downside may be much greater for the people uh, where you intervene. I mean, uh, the United States intervenes in the lives of others, uh, while for the United States, the downside may be big or, or limited. So it does raise important questions on the conduct of foreign policy, whether one should have a sort of minimalist intervention policy in the name of ethics, or whether, and what is the degree of risk that you are prepared to, to take in a situation where you never know where history ends? Well, Jean-Marie, you know much more about this than I do since you've been in the middle of this uh, in your job with the UN, but uh, I, I accept your point, which you can never know, but the question is how well do you try to make a reasonable decision on it? Let me give you an example before I get to the ones you mentioned. Uh, when Bush 41 was in his last month of his presidency, in December of uh, 92, he decided to send American troops to Somalia to distribute food because uh, the warlords were preventing the food from getting to starving people. Um, uh, it was a very humanitarian thing to do. In fact, it was, it was beyond what he would have done in other circumstances like for Kurdistan or, or Bosnia and so forth. And uh, within a year, uh, it led to Black Hawk Down, I mean, to essentially have an expansion of, I mean, the warlords were not just interfering with food for monetary purposes, it was power. If you controlled the food, you had power, and therefore, if you started to have UN troops come in there and interfere with their controlling the food, that was a threat to their power, so they killed a number of the UN peacekeepers. So Clinton then allowed a use of American military force against Idid and other warlords, and the net result was a fiasco, the shooting down of the Black Hawk and the demand in the American public and Congress for immediate withdrawal, which Clinton managed to stave off for about six months, but basically he withdrew the troops. So the question is, the unintended consequences of Bush 41 was to create a situation where it was impossible for his successor to keep the troops there. Then, um, the next year, you have, uh, or little, yeah, just about a year, you have uh, mm -hmm. the genocide in Rwanda. And the immediate reaction is, I can't, for Clinton, was I can't possibly send American troops into Rwanda. I've just had my head handed to me over what Bush left me in Somalia. I can't possibly do that. And what's more, uh, they didn't want to support the modest number of UN peacekeepers that were in Kigali. And you can say that you could not have saved 800,000 Rwandans, but you might have been able to save 50,000, 100,000 if you'd, instead of withdrawing the peacekeepers, you'd try to beef them up or support them. Um, and, but Clinton didn't make that fine slicing of the sausage, so to speak. And there was a withdrawal, as you remember, General Dallaire was despondent as a result of it. And uh, there was no way to, I mean, the, the, you might have not have saved everybody, but you might have saved some. 
So what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that you, if you say all or nothing, all intervene or no intervene, Clinton could not have sent this 82nd Airborne to Kigali in, in 93. He wouldn't have had the domestic support for it. He could have supported the UN peacekeepers in Kigali and tried to organize some coalition. He could have offered transport, logistics, and perhaps found one or two African countries to, to beef up the, uh, the peacekeepers in Kigali. But, that, but that's not why it phrased. So the moral decisions, I think it was Henry Kissinger who said this, uh, who uh, is not often known as a moralist. He said the hardest moral decisions are those ones between 51 and 49 percent. And I think that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the case here. Or to take it forward to Libya, um, you know, you're faced with, Obama's faced with the decision of do you try to save the citizens of Benghazi from Gaddafi's impending attack? And uh, with allies, with support from the Arab League, with a Security Council Chapter 7 resolution, uh, you're able to use force there. But the mission very rapidly expands to what becomes regime change. And the net effect is that Gareth's R2P is essentially put you know, in the ditch. And um, the Chinese and the Russians will never vote for it when it comes to Syria where it should have been applied. And then the question is, was there some middle way in which you could have perhaps instead of allowing the mission to change or by putting in forces to try to create a stable government after Gaddafi was killed, that you might have prevented what we have today, which is a chaos in, in, in Libya. So knowing the consequences, um, it, we don't know consequences. But the question is how, how well have we thought through the potential of these different consequences? And then how do we avoid separating them out into either or? How do we see if there are some middle positions? So I don't disagree a bit with what you said. But, I'm, but I, I don't like the view that people say, because it uh, may turn out badly, we do nothing. And in fact, there may be some things, even though they're modest, that we can do. Mm -hmm.